Call all hands. Beat to quarters. Come out the gun. Stand by this tavern battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Linstock's ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire. <laughs> Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's Indomitable Man of the Sea, Horatio Hornblower. Governor of Le Havre, with all the hundreds of administrative problems involved, would suit me better in my present retirement than it did in those days when I was more restless and active. But having accepted the surrender of the city, I was forced to keep a tight hold on the reins until Whitehall should see fit to relieve me of their duty. In the meantime, a clear head and an iron hand were needed. For instance, the matter of the fishermen's deputation was but one of many where firmness were essential. But, Your Excellency, uh, we are innocent fishermen. Indeed. We... My captain reports that just before he captured your boat, you just slipped out from Honfleur across the estuary. Oh. Honfleur is still under the rule of Bonaparte and is under blockade. I've no doubt that you sold your catch there at three times the price you could have obtained here in Le Havre. That, monsieur, is trading with the enemy. And it's within my power to have all three of you hanged without trial. I wish to retain the goodwill of all citizens of Le Havre, so on this occasion, I shall let you go. But your boat will remain with the prize court. Now, Captain Howe, what was that about a, a prince? A note from the foreign office, sir. They are sending the Duc d'Angoulême. Oh, are they? What am I supposed to do with him? Who is he, anyway? Eldest son of King Louis' brother. He married oh. Marie Therese, daughter of Louis XVI. Oh, yes, sir. He is the eventual heir of the Bourbon line. He must be about 40 now. As though I hadn't enough worries. Still, I suppose it might be useful to have a figurehead, and the royalists love a figurehead. When's he coming? He will arrive tomorrow, sir, if the wind is fair. Massed bands burst into a triumphal march. The salutes roared from the guns. Seamen and soldiers with their arms. And I stepped forward to receive His Royal Highness. Ah, Sir Horatio. I am Horatio. Ah, France. La Belle France. Anything less beautiful than the waterfront of Le Havre in a freezing nor'easter, I could not imagine, but it sounded well. And on that note, the carefully trained Duke continued through all the wearisome and frigid ceremonies which followed, the presentations, the processions, the dedication service, and the final reception of the Hotel de Ville. It was during the latter that I became aware of Brown, my coxswain, discreetly twitching my sleeve. Beg pardon, sir. Uh, Colonel Dobbs sent me in. He says he'd like you to see a dispatch what's just come in. That's very well. Uh, tell Colonel Dobbs I'll join him in my office when I can slip away without attracting notice. Ah, there you are, sir. Glad you managed to get away. 
I think the frogs are on the way out at last, sir. This message came through from Paris. Message from Paris? Uh, yeah, it was folded up in a button on the messenger's coat. He left Paris yesterday. Well, what does it say? Uh, this morning, siege artillery left the artillery park at Sablon by river going downstream... It included the 107th Regiment. The guns were 24 pounders, and I believe there were 24 of them. Three companies of sappers and a company of miners were attached. It is said that General Keogh will command. I do not know what other forces he will have. Bonaparte is still fighting desperately on two fronts, yet he still contrives to scrape a force to deal with us, because he knows we represent the deadliest menace to his power yet. However... It's useless to stand and complain. It's time for us to take the offensive. Sir, I want to report on the roads between here and Rouen. Rouen, sir? Of course. Don't you see? The Seine is the answer to this. By water, those heavy guns can be moved far more quickly than by road. The barges are being towed downstream night and day. They must already be nearing Rouen. Brian, come here. Go and get Captain Bush away from the reception. Aye, aye, sir. Colonel Dobbs, send a messenger down to the squadron and give orders for the following to be assembled. Now, let me see. We shall require... Bush, you thoroughly understand the scheme? I think it's quite clear, sir. If we can get our boats up the river quickly in the darkness, we ought to be able to supply the barges of Caldebec. Well, the tide is in your favor tonight, and I'm banking on the fact that you're dealing with soldiers. All their victories have been on land. They'll hardly expect an attack by water on their flank. And your landing party can burn and destroy to its heart's content. Well, I only have to wish you the best of good fortune now, Bush. I wish I were coming with you. Oh, that's impossible, sir. Half a dozen long boats on a river is no sort of command for a commodore. It's a perilous venture, Bush. It'll be all right, sir. Don't you go worrying about us, sir. I won't worry with you in command, Bush. Is all ready now? All ready, sir. Well, goodbye, Bush. Good luck. Goodbye, sir. Make way in the stern sheets there. I give way. Goodbye, sir. We'll be back before dawn. I prayed that Bush was right, but it was one thing to make comforting plans and quite another to watch men go off in the darkness to execute them. As I walked back through the darkness to the Hotel de Ville, I could not stifle a feeling of uneasiness, but I put it aside and looked forward to reading again for the hundredth time the latest letter from Barbara, my wife. This and a pile of other papers kept my mind fully occupied, and the night was well advanced when Colonel Dobbs knocked at my door and entered. All the papers say that your capture of Le Havre is the beginning of the end for a Bonaparte. What was that? I can feel the room shake, sir. And the candles jumped. Uh, it was an explosion. That could be at code then. It would seem that Bush has been successful and has blown up the French powder barges. A hundred tons of gunpowder. Yeah. That'll be a considerable explosion. Oh, come in. Oh, good morning, Captain Hart. <laughs> what is it? What is that? Two boats are coming down the estuary, sir. Only two? Only two, sir. One of them's Camilla's launch. I can recognize her through the glass. I don't think the other's from none such, but I can't be sure. Very good, Captain. I'll join you in a moment.
five boats lost out of seven. And Bush, was he lost too? Though I knew that the destruction of the French siege train would be well worth the loss of the whole flotilla, I could not coldly balance the profit and loss if my old friend Bush were among the losses. One boat's coming to the quay, sir. Huh? I'll have the officer here in 15 minutes. Good. Mr. Livingston, sir. Third officer of the Camilla. Take a seat, Mr. Livingston. Make your report, please. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> we uh, we went up the river without incident, sir. We could see the lights of Kodebeck before we were challenged from the bank. Captain Bush's longboat was leading. Where was your boat? Last in the line, sir. Oh. We went on without replying, according to orders. I could see two barges anchored in midstream and clusters of others against the bank. Yes. My orders were to run alongside the one farthest downstream, which I did. Go on. There was a lot of musketry fire higher up, but only a few Frenchies where we were, so we chased them away. On the bank were two 24-pounder guns on carriages. I had them spiked and then le levered them off the carriages and into the river. Good. One fell on the barge underneath and went right through it, sank it like a stone. Yes, yes. Well, and then what? Well, I led my party along the bank. Uh, there was a lot of shot there just landed from the next barge. I left a party to scuttle the barge and roll the shot into the river and went on myself with about 15 men. Mm -hmm. The boat's crew of the flame were there fighting, but the French ran away when we joined in. There were guns on shore and on barges. We spiked them all through the ones that were landed in the river and scuttled the barges. Ah. Well, excellent work. They'll be difficult to recover and put into commission. Yes, it must have been a fierce and bloody struggle in the dark on the riverbank. Oh, it was, sir. Uh, just then we heard drums beating and a whole battalion of infantry came down on us. My orders were to retire if opposed in force, so we ran back to the boats and the soldiers were firing at us from the bank when the explosion came. Yes, it, the explosion, what was that? It was the powder barges higher up the river, sir. Yeah. I don't know who set them off. Maybe it was a shot from the shore. Maybe Captain Bush... You've not been in touch with Captain Bush since the attack began? Oh, no, sir. He was at the other end of the line. Yes, I, see, I see, I see. Well, you better go and get some rest, Mr. Livingston. You, you've done splendidly. I shall see that an account of your actions reaches the proper quarters. Thank you, sir. I only obeyed orders. <laughs> The operation had been brilliantly successful. Deprived of his siege train and munitions, General Keogh would not be able to besiege Le Havre, and it would probably be long before Bonaparte could scrape together a similar force. But the loss of Bush was a crushing price to pay. It was hard to think of a world without Bush in it, of a future where I should never see him again. He was part of my life. But the very sympathy of Dobbs and Howard had the effect of nerving me to carry on. Your Royal Highness, Sir Horatio Hornblower, keep it. Ah, good morning, Sir Horatio. You wish to see me? Yes, Your Royal Highness. I do not know if you're acquainted with the circumstances that brought me to this part of the coast. You may tell me about them. Uh, well, there was a mutiny in one of our ships. I was sent to deal with it and succeeded in capturing the vessel and most of the mutineers. Excellent. Some 20 of them were tried and convicted and sentenced to death. I'm glad to hear it. I would be glad not to carry out those sentences, Your Royal Highness. Indeed? Well, it's impossible for me to pardon them without grave prejudice to discipline, but if Your Royal Highness were to intervene on their behalf, well, I could deny Your Royal Highness nothing. And why should I intervene, Sir Horatio? In the name of common humanity. Because 20 good men will be invaluable. Your Royal Highness could say that it was unfitting that the first days of the return of the dynasty should be marred by the shedding of blood of Englishmen, even guilty ones. Good men, useful men, mutineers. <laughs> Presumably Jacobin, revolutionaries, equalitarians, even perhaps socialists. It would be a fine beginning to the Regency if my first public act should be to pardon a parcel of revolutionaries. I've never known the world to be offended by an act of mercy, Your Royal Highness. You have strange ideas of mercy, sir. It appears to me that this remarkable request of yours has some meaning other than its apparent one. Perhaps you are a liberal yourself, hmm? One of those dangerous men who consider themselves thinkers. <laughs> Perhaps you think it would be a good stroke of policy for you to persuade me to brand myself as one who is willing to condone revolution. Sir, I protest. Your Royal Highness, uh, 
This is a monstrous insinuation. I do not see fit to accede to your request, Sir Equerry. Oh, there you are. Be good enough to conduct Sir Horatio out. <laughs> As I strode with burning cheeks past the courtiers and sentries, I was almost blind with fury. I stamped into my office, flung myself into my chair, sprang up again, paced the room. I hardly knew what I was doing as I struggled to restrain my anger. Dobbs and Howard gave one astonished stare at me and then bent studiously over their desks. But as my anger began to subside, a plan formed in my mind. I sat down again at my desk and addressed Captain Howard. I want those French fellows brought in here, the ones who came with the Duke, the Equerry, the Chevalier d'Honneur, and the Armoner. You fetch them in now, will you? I'll get them right away, sir. Colonel Dobbs, I'll trouble you to make ready to write at my dictation. Please show no surprise at anything I may ask you to write. I, I, oh, that was quick work, Howard. I met them in the corridor, sir. Good. Well, gentlemen... I've asked you to come to hear the letter I'm about to dictate and send to my Prime Minister. Uh, I think you understand English well enough to get the gist of it. Are you ready, Colonel Dobbs? Quite ready, sir. Very well. To the Right Honourable Lord Liverpool. My Lord, I find I am compelled to send back to England His Royal Highness the Duke d'Angoulême. But, sir, I should... Yes, kindly, do not interrupt. Oh, go on, Colonel, please. I regret... To have to inform your lordship that his royal highness has not displayed the helpful spirit the British nation is entitled to look for in an ally. Sir, this is impossible. It is Continue, not... Continue, uh, Colonel, please. During the few days in which I have had the honor of working with his royal highness, it has been made plain to me that his royal highness has neither the tact nor the administrative ability desirable in one so high a station. Sir, I must speak. You cannot send that letter. No, why not? And... You cannot send his royal highness back to England. You cannot. You cannot. No, he cannot. Is that so, gentlemen? Do you know who holds the power in this city? Do you know that I've only got to give the word and my ships and men would abandon Le Havre to the wrath of Bonaparte? But, but sir... Do I... not tell me that his royal highness would physically oppose an order. Have you ever witnessed a deserter being brought in? Well, the frog march is an undignified and painful method of progression. But that letter would discredit His Royal Highness in the eyes of the world. It might even endanger the succession. You, you will never send it, please, I sir. can only assure you that I can and that I will. I, uh, uh, well, uh, perhaps, sir, there has been some uh, misunderstanding. If His Royal Highness has refused some request of Your Excellencies, it must have been because he did not understand how important it was. Mm. If Your Excellency would allow us to make further representations to His Royal Highness, uh, I know... Uh, that... uh, yes, sir. If you would allow that, I'm sure His Royal Highness would understand. Ah. And um, what do you think, Colonel Dobbs? <laughs> I'm sure he would. and Howard were intelligent men. They took their cues without a word and added their pleadings to those of the Duke's staff. Nevertheless, it was only after considerable persuasion that I at last reluctantly allowed myself to agree that further representation should be made by the staff. Those worthy gentlemen shot out of the room in panic haste when I at last consented to allow them to approach their master. Then I sat back and relaxed. <laughs> Pardon, sir. Well, is it but, uh, His Royal Highness would like to come and see you, sir, if Your Excellency could kindly spare a few minutes. He's coming to you? My word, sir, he must be in a panic. Uh, I'm begging your pardon, sir, but I got a peep into His Royal Highness's room. <laughs> he was hopping about like a monkey and <laughs> using language I wouldn't have thought the Royal Highness would have known. Yes, thank you, Brown. That's enough. Captain Hyde, be so good as to wait upon His Royal Highness. Inform him that I'll receive him in... 
Fifteen minutes. When I've disposed of my more urgent business. Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers. Thank you.